Well, Dad's done most of my introduction for me for the keynote speaker. Mark Curry is an infectious diseases and public health physician at the Royal Darwin Hospital, professor of medicine at the Northern Territory Medical Program. He leads the tropical and emerging infectious diseases team at the Menzies School of Health Research. He began both the Darwin Perspective Meliodosis Study and the Darwin Perspective Snake Bite Study 34 years ago. So he's been around for a while, knows what's going on, and this will be an illuminating talk. Bart. Oh. <laughs> Spoiler alert, there will be a quiz. Well, thanks very much, Norman, and thank you, Ian and Di, um, for sponsoring this talk, and thank you to the organisers for asking me to come here. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Larrakia people. Um, this is where I live and work, and I have for a long time, and I pay my respects to elders, past, present, and uh, emerging leaders, and of course, all the uh, First Nations doctors, of whom there are quite a lot here, and uh, including the Pres of the uh, Australian Indigenous Doctors Association, who I've known for a long time, so thank you. Um, I, th I heard that all the other people doing uh, talks have been walking and talking, but I'm one of those people who can't walk and talk at the same time, like some well-known uh, American presidents of the past. So, um, so uh, macro and micro pathogens of the Northern Territory. So, up on, the, up on the left there, you can see this is from uh, CareFlight, who do all our, for us, do the, the evacuations to Royal Darwin Hospital. And that was just some advertisements they put out there. And, and I don't need to tell all those of you working in um, Central and Northern Australia or elsewhere remotely in Australia how, how wonderful the opportunities are. But remember that on those other two, you can see that you're never off the job. So no matter where you are, if you're going out for a bit of a walk or something, you'll always potentially be called on to to do something. So um, hands up those who have a PDF version of the Tropical Health Orientation Manual. Um, anyone have hard copies? There are a few left. So the Northern, and you can scan that if you haven't got it, and this is uh, a lot of the pictures, and including the uh, Rachel's got some prizes, and if you've actually looked at the manual, you should be able to answer some of the questions and get, get a prize later on. The NTPHN have funded the uh, next revision of this, which will be out early next year, and we hope this to be uh, able to link directly as the PDF version to guidelines and, and to more resources that are available. So, I'm going to be talking, and this is a very broad talk, macro pathogens, crocodile snakes and box jellyfish. And then I'm actually an infectious diseases physician, so then I'll actually, you, 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 I'd, I'd rather give the whole talk on these, but I've been told I have to talk a little about infectious diseases. So I'll talk about some micro pathogens, and they're small, and some would say less important. Some of you would have been in Darwin in 2011 when uh, President Obama came here, and he was given, and this is real, and you can get it from the Northern Territory News, crocodile insurance, which means that if you get killed by a crocodile, you get $50,000, or you don't get, it's no use to you because you're dead, but you're, um, <laughs> you're, uh, it goes to your estate. And um, just down the middle there, you can see that young fella there, uh, that's the son of one of our long-term, um, uh, one of my long-term colleagues and friends working here with me in infectious diseases, just to show that the other thing is that the kids of, of, um, kids of me uh, medical practitioners up here have so many more interesting opportunities than to become a doctor. And so he, uh, he has a very interesting career. And you'll see a little guy, another guy coming out of the bush behind him. I have no idea what that is. Um, and in the top and the middle is, and I can say this now, is a, for a former, still alive, surprisingly, health minister for the Northern Territory, and some of you may have worked out at Manangrida, and this is the Liverpool River. So whoever would go fishing in the Liverpool River, but that was before he became the health minister. So anyway. Um, so this is a, um, a story that, uh, and some of you will be from, from uh, remote Western Australia. And the Kimberley Coast is, <laughs> so the Kimberley Coast is absolutely fantastic. And so these are some re a retired Darwin couple who every dry season go yachting across to some of the remote, most remote places on the Kimberley Coast. I won't tell you exactly where they went, 
um, because they've asked me not to, because uh, they uh, had a very unfortunate uh, thing in that they, they parked their yacht, or whatever you do with yachts when you bring them in, they put their yacht, uh, and they walked about 80 metres in from the sea up a little creek. And this is the creek that they walked in, and that's actually the crocodile taken after the event, or the picture of the crocodile taken after the event. So the, so the mother, the woman was actually taken by the crocodile and the, father, the husband jumped into the water and it was too deep for him to detach the crocodile. It was not a massive sized crocodile, big enough though. And he had to drag her to the shore or to the, to the little bit on the creek with the crocodile attached and then he was able to kick the crocodile off. Um, and it took them three days to get back to Darwin. And you can see this is just showing some standard crocodile sort of uh, wounds. And the thing is, that the, the lesson from this is, well, first of all, I should start from the beginning is that history is so important. So where have you been? What's your exposure? Is it fresh water or salt water? Um, and we always have to ask, have you been overseas if someone comes in with an unusual infection? And then, so there's the history and then there's the examination. Now in relation to therapy here, remember when you have these bites, they can be either the bacteria from the oral flora of the animal that bites you, or it can be environmental pathogens, or it can be your own pathogens being pushed through the bites. And in fact, staph and strep are still the commonest infections that people with crocodile bites get. So you always have to cover with either flucox or cephalexin, for instance, um, staphylococcus and streptococcus. The interesting thing to finish off this story is she was doing really well and getting better and a week after uh, she was discharged from hospital, her husband who'd, been, who'd saved her came in and he had meliodosis. So, um, and I was gonna say only in the territory, but of course they weren't, they were in the Kimberley. So you can actually say only in the Kimberley maybe. So these are just some other um, freshwater crocodiles where an organism called Eremonas hydrophila is quite common and then the saltwater crocodile on the right hand side. So moving on, um, this is a couple of years ago now in Howard Springs Nature Reserve and a, a very um, intrepid four-year-old boy, there was a hole that he put his hand down and he felt something bite his fingers so he pulled it out and there was a snake on the end of his fingers. And um, you'll see the hematoma on his head and that's because he had a hypotensive collapse with loss of consciousness and banged his head and there was immediate bleeding there. And this is a classical scenario for brown snake envenoming where you have very severe coagulopathy and then you also at the same time can have hypotension for reasons that remain a little unclear. And if you fall over and collapse then and bang your head and you're coagulopathic already, you can of course get very an intracranial hemorrhage. So uh, this is the little boy there and you can see there in the middle picture the teeth marks or actually two of them are fangs and the rest may be small teeth and drag marks as he pulled his hand away, his thumb away and, and the snake let go and you can see the bleeding around the venipuncture sites from the venom induced consumptive coagulopathy. So this is classical for, for brown snake envenoming and this is just another severe envenoming on the left with uh, bleeding around the mouth. And this is another person who uh, collapsed and was unconscious, this little girl. And we're always worried about intracranial hemorrhage because that's what um, the has been a major cause of deaths from brown snake envenoming in Australia over the last 20 years. So severe coagulopathy. On the left in central Australia, Jackaroo loses pulse for 10 minutes after bite. This is the hypotensive collapse and then woke up. So at that time, if people have ischemic heart disease, they may well end up having an acute coronary syndrome and die. But the natural progression is for the blood pressure to, uh, to return and the people wake up. But then if they've fallen over, as you can see the two top people both had, um, both had hematomas and you can see that, it's, that there's a bit of bleeding there. Neither of those two had intracranial hemorrhage, but down the bottom right is a fatal intracranial hemorrhage from the Kimberley from many years ago from a brown snake envenoming. And, and the tragic death um, in 2006 in, in Alice Springs, in the urban Alice Springs from severe intracranial hemorrhage from brown snake envenoming. And we've had three deaths from brown snake in the last 20 years here, right here in Darwin, one of them pretty close to here, and they've all died from intracranial hemorrhage. So death adders, which are present particularly in the rural areas and not in the urban areas here, and right across the north of Australia, death adders 
cause neurotoxicity without really much else. So they may not have, their coagulation will be normal. They don't have the myotoxicity or the elevated CK that is seen with the mulga snakes, which are in the black snake group, but called king brown. So these are death adders, which have neurotoxicity, which is invariably the neuromuscular paralysis of this and other snakes with neurotoxins begins with ptosis. So our ED and remote area uh, doctors and nurses are told to not just look for drooping of the eyelids, but to do a fatigue test where the person is unable to maintain upward gaze. Uh, for those of you um, who may have done a neurology term, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the test for myasthenia gravis is that people fatigue on upward gaze and they can't maintain um, their eyelids looking up. And then they get ophthalmoplegia and then they get bulbar paralysis, which is where their airway needs protection to prevent aspiration. But they can still breathe if they've still got bulbar paralysis because their large muscles are still working. But then if they get intercostal paralysis and then diaphragmatic paralysis, then that's when they need to be not just intubated, but ventilated. These death adders are, are really an amazing group of snakes, a genus of, of snakes in Australia because they look nothing like our other, as you know, our other Australasian lapids, and they are the only one a group of our venomous snakes which are ambush predators. They behave like adders in Africa or rattlesnakes in the US, where they hide under leaf litter and they even have a little lure on the tail, as you can see in that bottom left-hand picture, and, they, and then a little a rodent or some uh, marsupial may come along and they then uh, uh, have a very rapid response to from coming out of the leaf litter to basically uh, grab in venom and hold on to that the prey until the prey dies. Uh, so they're ambush predators. All of our other big snakes, uh, the elapids, are pursuit predators. So these are nighttime biters. So this is just one of our stories. Again, a couple of years ago, this was a grey nomad from New South Wales and. Quite experienced with snakes, actually, her, both her and her partner. They're in a beautiful big mobile home at Tumbling Waters, which is about an hour's drive down on the, down on the Stewart Highway and on the way out to Berry Springs. And they were in their caravan park at Tumbling Waters. And she thought that the snake that, that just appeared on her, the doormat of their, um, of, of their big caravan or mobile home was uh, an olive python, a little olive python. So she picked it up with her left hand while holding in her right hand her dog, which travels with them on a lead. But she lost control and the snake bit her. And uh, that's a picture that actually her partner took before the bite happened because she'd been wandering around the caravan park showing other people the snake. Um, and uh, so the, the next picture that her partner took, uh, which she shared with me and was happy for me to, to, to use for education, is the paramedics. In the, that's inside the mobile home. It's a big mobile home out of Tumbling Waters. And then the next picture of her is here, ventilated in our ICU. So this was the most rapid onset of, of death adder envenoming that we've seen for a while, because normally that process can take ma many hours. But this was within two hours. Uh, so it took, them, it, it took them about two hours to go out, get her, and get her into ED, where they intubated her in ED, got up to ICU. She did fine, survived. And that's just showing we use the venom detection kit. The, one on the right is the uh, positive control, and then the one in the middle is the positive uh, death adder well. And you can see possibly some bite marks there. Around about 5 to 10% of our bites are not the normal encounter of snake meets human. Both human and snake have a defensive response, so a defensive bite. These are actually predatory bites that happen almost always at night time when someone's asleep. And what the snake sees or smells is a human and what they bite is uh, the snake it's sort of like obviously an unattainable um, meal because they don't realize the hand that they've bitten or the toe is attached to a big human so the snake is actually trying to get its meal from the person so this is a jillaroo out at mataranka station which is famous because lc station at mataranka famous for we of the never never and you can see um, that's her the next morning holding the olive python but she was minding a pet joey, uh, sleeping in a swag on the ground, and she needed a fork to remove the snake, her and her, her friends out at the station. And that's just showing you what a classic set of dentures for the upper jaw of a python looks like with the outer row of teeth and the inner row as well. So this is a six-year-old boy asleep in, in bed in Howard Springs, four o'clock in the morning. This is uh, only a couple of months ago. And the father, 
uh, the father killed the snake and the mother and child then drove into Palmerston Hospital with photos of the dead snake taken by the father. The photos were not adequate to formally identify the snake, so we didn't know whether the snake at that stage was venomous or non-venomous. So the father went outside to take another picture of the dead snake, and unfortunately, there was a second snake with the dead snake, and there's the two snakes together. So the father got bitten himself by the second snake, so he came in with both the both, uh, uh, both the snakes, and um, the um, so I think you're probably reading it. We had our, our doctors at Palmerston Hospital are very. Uh, this is four o'clock in the morning. This is what I. Uh, <laughs> it's um, all right. It's why I stay in Darwin. Is that I love these calls. And as you know, you know, we've had a lot of, me there's some media recently about how don't kill a snake, don't bring the snake in because it's dangerous. Well, in the Territory, we say to people, well, snakes are actually protected, you're not meant to kill them. But if you happen to have killed them, then uh, we want to see the snake because we can make decisions about what to do with that patient. And it makes a big difference if they're remote, as I'll show you in the next picture. So I did say, that's me in the green, back to the ED uh, uh, registrar, don't have anyone handle it, but as you can see, the registrar had already actually got the McGill forceps out and it actually sort of finished off. That snake was still alive. <laughs> so um, so the this is a very sad story, which various co snake colleagues labelled, the, it was actually mm -hmm. Romeo and Juliet, because the first snake to die was a male, because when we had both snakes, we were able to sex the snakes and I won't say how, down in the bottom right-hand picture. And the male died first, and then the female came looking for the, for the, the dead male and then bit the father. Um, very sad story. So this is why it's useful for us. Um, this is, so they're non-venomous, by the way, those snakes, because we, we actually had the snakes. So, and we're able to, therefore, to give them both tetanus shots, tell them about wound infection being uncommon, and send them both home within an hour of finding out what the snakes were, rather than the 24 hours we have for rural because of death adders. So this is in Borolula, which is as far as away as you can get for care flight, our retrieval team from Darwin just about, and it's a four hour flight down there and back. So we were rung by the uh, nursing staff at Borolula and this is what had bitten someone and they mm -hmm. thought that this might be a very small brown snake, which would mean uh, definitely evacuation to Catherine or to Darwin Hospital. And you can see that black stripe over the back of the neck, and our brown snakes often do have black markings on the back of the neck. Anyway, the bottom line was, was that with careful looking at the pictures that they sent us, it was clear that this was in fact not a snake at all. This is a legless lizard. And you can see there on the right-hand side, they actually it's a rare legless lizard that they sent up to us from Borolula through pathology. So you can see the, the rudimentary legs with the, with the red arrow there. So this is a hooded scaly foot, and um, so obviously non-venomous. So we were able to say to the care flight, you don't need to fly, you know, uh, and they were able to then send the person home from Borodol. So that saved. So with identifying snakes, and, and the main thing is to know that it's the snake that bit the person, which is absolutely essential, because on two occasions we've had snakes which I've been asked to identify, and it's been clear from the story that these were not the snakes that bit the person. And in one case, it was a, a young woman who who was envenomed, but the snake was non-venomous in ED at Royal Darwin. And she said, no, this isn't the snake that bit me, but no one had asked her the question. And the snake had come in with her in a bag. And she said, no, no, when I was bitten, my brothers went out and that was just the first snake they saw, so they killed it. Um, <laughs> and um, so, so you asked the question. So, um, Coronex Flecker is the major box jellyfish. And, and each, each sting from, a, anyone here been bitten by a, box jellyfish tentacles, it stings like a lot. And the thing is that, um, and uh, they can be very severe and they can also be fatal. And all of our deaths in the Territory in the last uh, 25 years, uh, actually more than that now, all 14 deaths in the Territory since 1975, in fact. So time passes. I know, Di, you were saying generations. I, I think, uh, anyway, that's, uh, so they can be very severe. That guy up in the middle, um, uh, he was swimming at, at our Darwin uh, free beach. Anyone been to the free beach? It's actually our nude beach. 
And so he was actually wearing swimming trunks at the nude beach. So that was my main question to him. You're at the free beach. Why were you wearing swimming trunks at the free beach? Anyway, he was very happy that he was. Um, uh, but, he, uh, but I didn't have another picture from the other way around because that wouldn't have been right. Um, so our 14 deaths in the Territory have all been uh, kids in remote communities. And each one of those is an absolute tragedy. And to avoid being stung in the stinger season, which is right now, beginning of October to the end of May, people should not be entering the water. Um, our last death was in 2007, but there have been two deaths in far north Queensland. Those colleagues from Queensland will have been aware of these, one at Bamaga and one at Mackay. The last one, and each of these is a tragedy, and the last one at Mackay being a classic, sudden, you know, very quick onset. These deaths happen far more quickly than snake bite or certainly spider bite deaths. They, if you're going to die from coronary envenoming, it will happen within the first 10 to 20 minutes usually. So you'll have a cardiac arrest on the beach. So they got him out of the water. He had lots of tentacles around his legs, which they pulled off. A lot of vinegar was administered. CPR was administered immediately. Surf Life Savers and critical care paramedics treated the boy at the scene, but he died in the Mackay Base Hospital a short time later. That's the tragedy of, of uh, severe coronary envenoming. Okay, so I'm going to move to micropathogens. So I'm going to, these are the ones that I'll talk about. Marine Vibrios, Meliodosis, Scabies, Strep A, Staph aureus, and Tinea. But before I get onto that, I sometimes get asked to give talks about infectious diseases and climate change and what's going to happen with climate change and infections. And, and you know, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about infectious diseases, but all the tropical infections that people talk about that will be impacted by climate change, we can deal with most of those, or pretty much all of them. We will never have malaria as a problem again in, in Australia because of our public health capacity. Uh, um, dengue can come in, and if the Aedes aegypti expands, then we will get increasing dengue. But the thing is, we can deal with severe dengue. But what we can't deal with is sea level rise in relation to our coastal communities, both here in the Territory and certainly in the Torres Strait Islands, but particularly our Pacific neighbours. And it's real and it's already happening. And up the top right is the first community, uh, these villages in... Um, I think that might have been Fiji, where they had to move the, the village from being on the shore further back up the hill. Down the bottom right is what's happening in Kakadu, and you can see a map there of the predictions of where the inundation with salt water will be happening. And then this is at the UN 2021 Climate Change Conference. Tuvalu's foreign minister, you may recall this, delivered his speech by um, internet from the ocean to the delegates to stress the threat that, the, that his country faces. And there's a lot said about what's already happening, as many, well, some of you will know much more than I do about in the Torres Strait. This is absolutely real. And uh, the UN Human Rights Committee has actually found Australia has violated Torres Strait Islander rights by failing to protect them from climate change. But there's a strength-based narrative to that that is very evident here in the Territory and across Northern Australia. And that's the First, First Nations land and sea rangers who are working um, on country, and these are career pathways for both men and women. And on the, on the bottom, uh, sorry, on the top left is the, the um, female indigenous rangers whole key to tackling the challenge of climate change. And there's a lot of really strong positive messages, and that ties in, of course, with the um, with traditional um, fire uh, practices. So I was called down to ED because they thought this was a snake bite. I'm not quite sure why, but they thought this was tissue damage from a snake bite. And this, and this is where history is important, because this chappie had been out fishing in the Gulf of Carpentaria in a place which is actually not that far from a very big mine where it is known that there is environmental damage to, the, um, to, uh, to where uh, there is damage to the rivers going out into the ocean. And this is bullus cellulitis, um, and it is bullus cellulitis from Vibrio vonificus, a marine Vibrio, which has a, these marine Vibrios have a selective advantage when there's environmental perturbation to, uh, to seawater and to also in the rivers. And they, for various, uh, they have a lot of genes that give them an advantage over other bacteria with which they compete in that marine environment. So this is just showing how severe this bullous cellulitis can be. But the other thing is that this particularly affects people who have liver damage. And so 
there you can get severe sepsis and you usually need to have very extensive surgery, as you can see down in the, the bottom left there. So meliodosis, which is something that we see a lot here, and Darwin has a higher rate of, Darwin in the rural area of uh, Darwin, like uh, Howard Springs and around there, has a higher incidence of meliodosis per population than anywhere else in the, in the world. Our Thai colleagues, whom we learn a lot from, have a large, much larger population, so their numbers are much higher than ours. Um, but we get anywhere between 50 and maybe up to 90 or so cases a year in the top end. And it's an infection with this environmental bacterium. It's in the soil and surface water. Animals get infected, but it's not a zoonosis. Uh, humans and animals both get infected from the environment. And it's a strong association with rainfall and, again, environmental damage. So as of today, over the last 35 years, we've had 1,440 culture positive cases. It's rare in children because children are healthy. And this is actually an opportunistic infection where if you're living with diabetes or if you're on steroids for one reason or another, or if you're on chemotherapy and your immune system is um, not going so well, or if you're over a certain age. And when we first did this study, I called, I started analyzing age as a, as a bivariate. I said, anyone over 40 is old. But every five years or so, we increase the age a bit. So the question is, I just saw Andrew smiling there. What's old, Andrew? Like anyone over what? <laughs> uh, so the point is age is another, age does affect your immune system. So uh, some people have said Darwin's no place for old men, but um, that's another story. Um, so, uh, um, so anyway, the thing is most people survive. Our mortality is now down to less than 10%. But it's a terrible infection, and it's an urban infection as well as a rural infection. And we also, so we've had increasing in the Darwin urban environment because of our in building of new suburbs and a an increase in the population with diabetes in particular, and the fact that we keep our oncology patients here now rather than send them down south. So the urban numbers have increased, the remote community numbers have remained pretty much the same. So we now have more in the urban setting than remote, which is different from how it used to be historically. So this is just our ICU. And within the week or two after severe weather, that's when we see cases. So that's lung with multiple lesions, prostate abscesses, and then microabscesses. So this was, we had four people at the one time in ICU at Royal Down Hospital back, that's over 10 years ago now, three being ventilated. That was our worst year when we had 97 cases. Um, so over half are blood culture positive and 21% need to go to ICU or 25% to ICU, 21% with septic shock, mostly septic shock and pneumonia. And then you have these other presentations. Um, so these are all fatal pneumonia from meliodosis. A lot of these pictures are in the Tropical Health Orientation Manual as well. Um, and then healthy people get skin disease only sometimes, so particularly the kids. So only 5% are kids, but they often will present with an, a non-healing skin lesion. So if, if the lesion is not healing, the swab's going to the lab, you need to put on the lab form, please look for meliodosis and the laboratory will put it on a special selective agar or into a selective broth and that will kill off the staph and strep, which may outcompete the, the, the Burkholderia, which is the meliodosis bacterium. Prostatic abscesses are very common, need drainage. So you can see with the CT scan on the left, ultrasound on the right, and the pus that needs to be drained. And then spleen abscesses, sometimes needing splenectomy, liver abscess, even adrenal abscesses. So we know that it's acquired through mainly the one down the bottom, percutaneous. Ingestion is very common in Southeast Asia where they have non-chlorinated water supplies. We know our water supply has Burkholderia in it at the point of origin, but it's adequately chlorinated. So parent water are actually testing their water frequently for meliodosis and their chlorination is adequate. So it's not in our system, but in countries in like uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, they have a lot of kids with ingestion and swallowing and getting sick. Inhalation though is the thing we worry about after severe weather when there's wind and rain. So. It's, we think that there's a big shift to inhalation after severe weather, and there's a shift to pneumonia, mediastinal collections, like you can see on that CT on the right, and this is the most severe form of meliodosis that we worry about. So when there's severe weather, particularly if there's a cyclone somewhere in the top end, and it's happened in far north Queensland as well, it's in the week or two after the people start coming in. Okay, so uh, Rachel, this is the first question. We've got the merch. I want anyone, who's the first person to yell out what it is? 
scabies not good enough? <laughs> Who was the first person to say crusted scabies? Here. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to point. So don't forget we have guidelines. So there's national skin guidelines, there's a healthy skin program. We have all of these. I hope it's good. Is it? Ah, oh, it's a hat. Fantastic. So don't forget there are guidelines out there. And the Tropical Health Orientation Manual, we'll try and link in with all of these. Scabies mites are beautiful. You see that mummy mite there with the, with the egg in the middle? And then that's just another electromicrograph. Now have a look at this. This is actually an electromicrograph of the skin. You can see the eggs hatching there. And then down in the middle there with the legs is the, is the mother mite and the eggs coming out there. Um, but remember that not everything is uh, crusted scabies. Crusted scabies is rare. So this is just complicated scabies, which is scabies followed by staph and strep infection. And in fact, this was a group G strep. And remember that skin sores are predominantly group A strep in the context of central and northern Australia. And so that's strep A, which is um, um, group A strep, strep pyogenes. The more severe streptococcal infections goes to necrotizing fasciitis, as you can see here, which is an awful uh, condition that, and it's very painful. And the thing is, they may, the skin looks dusky, but it's the pain and they look systemically unwell. It needs surgery and antibiotics. And also, we do use immunoglobulin in that situation. Not all pyoderma or skin sores or impetigo. I think dermatologists can separate the three. I think, for me, they're all pretty much the same clinically. Um, but the thing is, we do also get staph. And the staphs, not all staphs are the same. There are no, less virulent staph that will not kill anyone. And then there are these very virulent staph which have particular genes that can cause very severe sepsis. So this is a less virulent staph causing um, infection on top of scabies. This is a uh, Caucasian man, young man in our ICU. And I think Di might have looked after this person with a chest tube in multiple pustules in the skin and multiple abscesses, which I won't show in many organs. And that's a healthy person with a virulent community staphylococcus. Some of them could be MRSA, some of them could be MSSA. So if they're critically ill, we don't uh, take a risk and we always add in vancomycin to start with. But for most staph, you can start with, uh, uh, not vanc, but you can use cephalexin or fluclox um, or diclox um, until, uh, and, unless that fails, and then you might go to coverage for the MRSA. And don't forget that as well, tinea is a very common, uh, a common problem as well. And for the tinea we see, it's a granular variety of trichophyton and rumen, which, which will never respond to topicals. They need to have tabinafin for this. And that needs primary care observation because if you're going beyond the two weeks of tibinophen, which will clear the tinea corporis, but will not deal with the nail disease, if you're going beyond two weeks, or if there's a level of abnormal LFTs, you need liver function tests at two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and a full blood count, because very occasionally there will be neutropenia. So under primary care, you can cure these, but people will be reinfected within 12 months from, uh, this, is spread, this is an anthropophilic, it spreads person to person. So, uh, but people often want their, their tinea managed, and it is manageable, but tibinophen, oral tibinophen is required. So the answer is, Rachel, are we ready? Okay. Who said that? Here we go. Ah, oh. Cat up there, Cat from Gove, a Nullum boy, sorry. This way, up here. Cat, thank you, good on you. So this is carvedemopathy. So it's a bit unfair because I don't think you have too much of this outside of um, Arnhem Land communities. Carb is actually pretty good if you have it in, 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 in a reasonable amount. Like in Dai, I think, was hopping into the carver in, in, in uh, Fiji as a traditional thing. And, and, and it's, it's a ceremonial carver, sorry. But excess carver can be, uh, you get demopathy and some other things. Okay. This is where we need dermatologists because I happened to be in clinic when I saw this person and I was about to get my, my reds to come down and do a biopsy. And fortunately, Deb Tillichratney, our dermatologist, was next door, in the room next door. And I said, Deb, please just come and have a look at this. It took him a microsecond to diagnose this and it doesn't need a biopsy because it's a clinical diagnosis and it's not an infection. Huh? Could be. Sorry? 
Ah, uh, no. No. It's just simple eczema, discoid eczema. <laughs> Did anyone say eczema? Anyone? Any, any shy person? And look at this. And so rather than give antibiotics, which is what I know to do, Dev said, Dev, Dev said, just give some topical steroids. And I said, no, no, we can't use topical steroids. And we did, and look at that, three weeks later. Okay. We're, getting, we're coming to the end, Norman. Who said syphilis? Oh. Are we allowed to double dip or not? Two prizes. Two prizes here. Two hats. So this is syphilis. Yeah. Don't forget syphilis. Syphilis is a big issue and we have a lot of, you're all aware of the protocols we have for that. I heard that, who said that here? Cutaneous larva migrants here, prize. Okay, so this is actually the dog and cat hookworm getting in the skin because it's not adapted to humans. It doesn't get up to cause the standard hookworm in your gut. You don't swallow it. It, it migrates around in the skin causing a lot of itchiness and it responds beautifully to ivermectin orally. How many of you have seen cutaneous larva migraine? Some of you would have seen that. This is out of the Tropical Health Orientation Manual. Very itchy, and this is a new professor came up, went out fishing because he came here to fish, not to work, and, um, and I'm not gonna accept sandflies because they are not sandflies. What are they? Who said midges? Here we go. <laughs> Prizes again. They are not sandflies. They are biting midges. We have no, and, and um, sandflies, as you know, are phlebotomines, but these are actually culicoides, biting midges. But we call them sandflies. Of course we do. Okay. Last one, I think. This was a backpack of working down in Catherine. Very itchy. Who said, up here, someone, who is a person up here who said mango? Mango, over here. That's the furthest over. Mango demopathy. How many of you have had mango demopathy? It's really, I, I, I'm told it's really uncomfortable. Uh, okay, I, I won't, th this, is, this is worth the super duper merch. <laughs> Bush holiday. Andrew knows, but he's being very quiet. Okay, this is a rover beetle, Pederis australis, that they fly in from their uh, primordial swamps and go to lights. And they extrude a toxin called uh, pederic acid or pederin, and then it causes blistering. And it's resulted in the evacuation of a whole outstation many years ago. And these are the little creatures, as you can see, they're small. And they, they're not biting, it's, it's their defense in their abdomen. And this is just one of the more severe cases from a camping on a sandy beach with a lot of lights, a remote offshore holiday, 80, 800 meters inland was the freshwater swamp from which these things in the middle of the night came in. No lesions until the next morning and then a few days later in the swag, the mother found the uh, little beetle there. Okay, so this is the scan me for the um, tropical orientation manual. Thank you. Um, my computer didn't seem to be registering questions, so we'll take questions from the floor. So we've got time for a couple of questions if you've got them. Bart, you mentioned marine vibrio there and climate change. I mean, you, the, the Gulf areas around the world where you get marine vibrio, they, they say they're susceptible to vibrio cholera as well. What risk have we got in northern, northern yeah. Australia of, of cholera? Yeah. So, um, that's absolutely right. That, and indeed, Vibrio cholerae is actually present in, in Australian waters in small amounts. And it's not the same strain that has been spreading uh, that pandemic cholera that spread around the world, which came out of the, um, the, the Gulf, uh, uh, the Bay of Bengal. And, and cholera was the first infectious disease where a legitimate and robust and a verifiable relationship with sea surface temperature change was made between the emergence and the spread out of the Bay of Bengal of Vibrio cholerae to many other parts of the world. 
So that's... So this is the 19th century pandemic. Uh, well, there was the 19th century pandemic, but this is the more recent spread as well that's been happening. But in addition... So it's like the seventh pandemic, I think it is. Oh, it doesn't matter. Is that, going, yeah. I, I don't even get a prize for that, and I don't even know the answer. <laughs> we tried, but it's a good question. Um, so the business about um, our Vibro colliery is interesting because it's in our waters, and occasionally there's been a case in the Kimberley, for instance, some years ago, the main vibrios we have are these other ones, which is Vibrio volnificus and Vibrio parahemolyticus, which are also, uh, they're the ones that adapt also to, to the more high surface temperatures and also potentially damage to the local environment. But, the, but there is no doubt that a Vibrio colliery, which is a virulent strain, could potentially, through the ballast of ships or other things, get deposited somewhere on our shores and then get established. And, and that's a very virulent, the virulent cholera, cholera organisms are very bad in circumstances where you don't have the options for rehydration and antibiotics. But in the con it's, about, it's a bit like the malaria story. Even if it got here, our public health would deal with it because oral rehydration, intravenous in sick people, and then tetracyclines. I mean, we can deal with cholera. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the disaster scenario would be environmental disruption, a hurricane or something like a major storm mm. and, and that sort of thing and you could have a, an outbreak, but yeah, as you say, yeah. controllable. You didn't talk about TB in the north. TB, yeah, so t uh, tuberculosis um, is still being transmitted in Australia in, in certain uh, remote indigenous communities. So. But overall, we do in Australia have the lowest rate of tuberculosis and our rates in the remote communities are still, uh, they are a lot, they're less than they were. So we do have public health initiatives in, in each of WA, NT and Queensland for identifying cases and then contact tracing. And there is now also, as you know, there's the prophylaxis for the close contacts. So, so no XMMDR. So yeah, so uh, all the cases of resistant tuberculosis that have occurred in Australia have been imported, mostly from nor northern neighbours. So in the Territory for, um, for the last 20 years, we've had more cases of TB in, that have been in people who are, have come into Australia from other countries who have then usually um, activated tuberculosis. But in the last, one of the last two years, there was an equal number of Indigenous cases. Um, so it's still an issue for us, for sure. Can we go to the microphone? G'day, Bart. Scott Kitchener. Um, I'm interested in what, whether you think that JE vaccinations, are, the setting is correct for, for rural Australia. Yeah, so the JE story is really fascinating, and thanks for that question. Um, what's happened with Japanese encephalitis is that in 2022, as you know, there was the infected piggeries, and then a whole bunch of cases. Uh, I think it was up, got up to 45 cases in southern Australia. What's not well known is that, in fact, a year before, there was one and probably two cases in the Northern Territory, which were the Sentinel cases. Uh, and the last case of JE that we know for sure was... Um, so you was, think there were Sentinel cases for Southern Australia? Sorry? You think there were Sentinel cases? No, 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 so sorry. It, 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 it came into the Northern Australia and then moved down south. So there was a, it took a year between the case in, um, it took a, almost a year between the case in the ENT, which was fatal, which we were absolutely very surprised about, a local person um, with fatal JE. And then a year later, it, well, there was the outbreak in the piggeries, explosive, and in southeastern Australia, associated with the, with, the, with the La Nina events, as you know. And then what happened was there were models and other things saying, well, the next summer, which will be the summer of 2022, 2023, what's going to happen? Is JE going to be in our feral pigs and then break out again? Is it still going to be in pigs down south? Is it in water birds that are still down south from their migrations? No cases. But we had our biggest cluster in many years of MVE, again, in the south southeastern states because of the rain. So we had JE, then we had MVE. And there has been no more JE in Australia, a local JE. And the models didn't predict it. And basically, um, people have dropped the ball on it a bit. We, I don't understand what's going on. And so in relation to vaccination, we pushed out vaccination in the NT, as you know. And I think that there's, a, there's another aspect for us 
potentially benefiting from that vaccine, and that is that this vaccine, unlike previous vaccines, may have some protection against Murray Valley encephalitis as well, which is purely speculative. So at the moment, we've stopped vaccinating for JE, and it's now been, um, well, really since uh, 2022. So we've now been over two years with no JE in, in, in Australia, basically. So it's weird, and I don't think we understand, just, we don't understand what's happening with our environment, we don't understand what's happening with our birds, and I would say, if we had a national CDC that was actually functional, we would actually, and I, I mean, I've, uh, we've been plugging on about this, and we have been very criticised in the NT for saying for 20 years we need a national CDC. And it's been, and, and finally we have one, but it's as if people have lost the momentum for that. And the, the bottom line is they're not funding it enough, they're not getting the expertise they need in, um, and so we're, we're told just wait, it's going to evolve. But, but what's happened is, is that they delisted JE as a national notifiable disease of concern. It's still notifiable. So there's, there's very few people working on it. And um, we don't know what's going on. And, the, and what's going to happen with, the, uh, with La Nina coming back in the next year? Will JE break out? Will it be new JE from the north? Or will it be the same G4 strain that is hiding out in our feral pigs here in the territory? And I've been saying that we need to do more feral pig surveillance, but it's expensive. And the, uh, both Commonwealth and state governments on the eastern side of Australia, which is where they should be sampling their feral pigs to see whether it's still there, no one has an appetite for it. Barrett, thank you. Okay. It's been Sorry to prattle on about that. <laughs> yeah.